this is um, I'd like to welcome you to module five in this in this course uh, on the fundamentals of development planning. This this um, module focuses on institutional arrangements and the financing mechanisms, uh, you know, in building the national development plan. The model presents a variety of alternative institutional arrangements that have been adopted in different contexts and their relative efficacy in delivering desired outcomes and impact. We we'll also look at the issues connected with institutional capacity and autonomy as a bear on the governance of the development planning process. The module addresses the costing of development plans and uh, and then the, the mechanisms which have been employed to finance the plans, as well as new financing possibilities that are potentially available to, to countries to, to, to tap, especially in the case of um, Gambia. Look at the various uh, funding uh, strategies, the funding mechanisms uh, that have been deployed, uh, at least uh, uh, getting examples even from the recent plan. Uh, the NDP 2018 to 2021. Now let's look at the meaning of institutions uh, and their importance in uh, development planning. <clears throat> institutions refers to the rules of the game of a society, but more formally, the humanly devised constraints that structure human interaction. That, that, that is in terms of the, uh, uh, the concept, you know, Institutions are important because of the key roles they play in facilitating private investment and capital flows and their impact on economic growth and the business environment generally. They are so important with regard to the quality of public infrastructure, the policy environment, political stability, labor cost, stability of prices, and even the exchange rates. So you, you, you look at the various rules and regulatory regimes that guide these indicators. So this, 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 this conceptually uh, uh, will be what we mean by institutions as it applies to, to all this. So all the policies that we're applying to um, uh, some strategies are, are derived from those to achieve the objectives of the plan have to, have to be guided by some rules. You're talking about private investment, or even foreign investment, domestic investment in various sectors of that economy in, in order to, 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 to uh, generate growth. They, they, they have to be some rules guiding the actions of all uh, uh, stakeholders or agents in, 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 the, in that economy. So the, the, that rules are very important. It has to be, it has to be uh, clearly uh, design so that it doesn't disrupt the operations of the actors in the in, in the economy. So it's very important. Now we, we come to uh, uh, the institutional arrangements, you know, for developing the, the plan. What what are these institutional arrangements like like this module uh, wants to uh, bring out? Institutional arrangements for developing a plan refer to the to these policies the systems and processes, including legislation that the countries employ to harness resources and manage the activities efficiently and if, to effectively coordinate with others in order to accomplish the development goals and objectives. So this, this, these are the arrangements. If we are, if we are talking about indebtedness, for example, you want to take foreign loan, you know, some countries approve of uh, how much to borrow externally, you know, have to come from the parliament. So, and then there are rules uh, on the ground and then even legislation and even governance arrangements uh, before all those loans can be, can be approved. So, and sometimes if you need external financing and this, these rules, these institutions must work effectively for you to, to be able to get uh, the, the uh, uh, right resources uh, for you to pursue this goals. In many African countries, the key agencies that, that are connected with this, with this institution that are directly involved also in the planning process are, for example, the cabinet, 
is very important. The executive arm of government. Then the parliament is, is, is key. Then you have uh, uh, agencies set up from this. You have the National Planning Commission, general in many African countries. Then you have the line ministries, and then you have some uh, regional zone offices of these of these ministries where you delegate authority, you delegate power uh, for them to implement at uh, at uh, various subunits down down the line. Now we we. We have to illustrate uh, with examples of institutional arrangements uh, for planning. We we'll use two countries to illustrate the roles of these uh, institutions, the structure in place during the planning, uh, during the building of national plans. I will take Nigeria and then Gambia, so that you can see the uh, uh, involvement of the various institutions in the recent 2018 to 2021. Uh, NDP for Gambia, and then you can see our experiences, the experience of Nigeria during the 2020 uh, visioning process. Now, uh, let's let's take the vision 2020 uh, uh, in Nigeria and look at the institutional arrangements uh, as an example to let us know clearly what what we mean about this and their roles in in the development of plans. The Nigeria Vision 2020-2020, the process was easily the most wide ranging consultative process ever undertaken in the annals of the history of planning in, in Nigeria. And we here, we illustrate those arrangements uh, and the operations and so on in, in, in this slide. You see the, it's, it's so elaborate. Only when the uh, exercise was being mooted, the, 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 the structure was put in place. You have the presidency. Then under the presidency directly, we have the National Planning Commission at that, at that time. And then you have a, 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 a thematic working groups. Thematic working groups are set up, you know, that take care of development uh, priorities, objectives in various sectors of the economy, and then we have a, a central working group that will look at their work. And then you have a, a facilitator, there's a consultant also harmonizing all these things. And then you have um, a drafting committee at the end of the day when the inputs from all the thematic working groups have been put together. Now we now have a drafting committee to really, to really work on the various layout and then to, 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 to put up the, the report. And then you have uh, uh, the central uh, working groups also looking at it. And then you have the cabinet, uh, all those in the cabinet, uh, presidency giving approvals as, as, as the need arises. And we can, we can uh, see clearly the roles and responsibilities in this operational structure uh, how things uh, work out. We, we have the National uh, Vision 2020 Council that, that handles the final approval of the, of the vision uh, document. Then we have the National Vision 2020 Secretariat. This served as the administrative headquarters and is domiciled at the National Planning Commission. Now we have the National Vision 2020 Steering Committee. And this uh, one there with overall coordination of the thematic groups and activities. Now we have the national technical working groups. This uh, group examined development objectives, policies, and priorities in key thematic areas, such as agriculture and food security. I was a member of this, of this group, actually. We have the business environment and competitiveness. We have transport, education, energy, financial sector, information and communication technology. We have judiciary and the rule of law. We have manufacturing, environment, and sustainable development governance, political system, human development, minerals and metals, sports development, small and medium enterprises, foreign policy, housing, employment, trade and commerce, urban and rural development, science, technology and innovation, regional development, media and communications, culture, tourism, national orientation, water and sanitation, health, education, corporate governance, and social responsibility. So, 
we have all these thematic groups outlining their own objectives, the priorities, and so on, working it out. And then, and then uh, for the for the central working committee uh, to look at, and then uh, uh, then uh, get the inputs into the plan document. There is also the macroeconomy working group. You know, I, I, I we mentioned earlier on the role of the macroeconomy framework. You know, to look at the projections and provide policy guide uh, for the various sectors to achieve their plans and targets. There's also the special interest group examine development priorities and strategies in rare areas such as media, women, youth, persons with disability, labor, the legislature, judiciary, security, traditional rulers, religious organizations, civil society, and, and even Nigerians in the diaspora. These are special interest groups. So the interests of these groups, you know, vary, and then they are now brought together so that they can make contributions. We can make contributions. So we have the Central Working Group of 33 member Central Working Group. I was also a member of this Central Working Group, which was charged with the responsibility of harmonizing all inputs received towards the formulation of the vision blueprint. The Central Working Group harmonized input from 29 national technical working groups, 12 special interest groups, and stakeholders development committees in the 36 states and Abuja, and similar committees in the federal ministries, departments, and agencies. Now we have now have an editorial, editorial team which, which come together to prepare the final, the final uh, document. Of course, there's a facilitation group which provides technical guidance to various groups and, 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 and committees. So that is the um, that is a structure and that is how it played out during that uh, 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 process of uh, developing our National Vision 2020. And the uh, uh, procedure at the other time, you know, from that vision, then we supposed to uh, distill, derive the first plan imp uh, implement, the first implementation plan, which was to be 2010 to 2013, like that. So from there, we derive another one, implementation plans until, until 2020. So this, this is uh, this is the process. So you get the, this vision document, and from there you display your first implementation plan, second implementation plan, and third implement, implementation plan before you get to to the destination in 2020. Now let us uh, look at a similar uh, structure, or, or uh, and in this case um, the uh, planning and institutional arrangements in, in the Gambia. Let's 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 look at this. The institutional arrangements has also also been recognized, and it, it, we we will see how how this thing unfolded during the recent plan. Now, in the case of Gambia, when the Minister of Economy, Planning, and Industrial Development, as, as at that time in 1974, a multi-level planning structure was developed at that time, and at the apex, for taking a historical perspective. Uh, it was since that time that we really have this multi-level planning structure being developed. At the apex of the system was the National Development Council, headed by, by, by the president at that time, and in, included selected ministers, the governor of the central bank, three, three members of parliament, chairman of five divisional development committees, and representatives of the private sector. And at the sectoral level, there existed three sectoral planning units, agriculture, works, and the Ministry of Health. And this, the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Industrial Development served as a secretariat for, for these bodies. There must be a, a secretariat. There must be, you know, to, 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 to coordinate uh, the whole uh, arrangement. Now, with the coming of the new government, it was evident that a new national development plan had to be drawn up that took account of the momentous changes the country had gone through the vision of the new government and the expectations of the country's citizens. The, the election of a new government and the National Assembly election that followed in April 2017, as well as uh, transformations within the judiciary resulted in wholesale changes within the three centers of power under the constitution of the Gambia. The need for a strong institutional framework for a national development plan was given the recognition and the Gambia generously at lines 
such a framework in the 2018-2021 plan document. Let, let's, let's look at what uh, that document emphasized, the SHINA framework. It has two interlinked components. First, we have the, the first component is the policy oversight and coordination, the coordination functions. And the second component is the technical and implementation functions. And we have a, a schematic uh, presentation of that. The key institution involved in the oversight and policy uh, coordinations are the National Assembly, the Cabinet, the Interministerial Steering Committee, a multi-stakeholder national coordinating committee, and regional governance forum. So this is um, uh, presented here, illustrated here thematically. You can see uh, the various, the regional technical advisory committees and the cabinet, the National Assembly. You can see the interconnections and the uh, institutional arrangements. So this is what we mean by institutional arrangements. You put this one in place, you define the roles and responsibilities clearly, and you have a secretary to coordinate the activities. And then you set the ball rolling, and then everyone tries to uh, uh, perform its own task, and then the plan document put together, and then it will be to be written for everybody to, to start to use. Then, and in terms of the roles and responsibility, at the operation policy oversight and condition level, you have the rules specified as follows, even right from presidency to, to, to the regional administration. First, the vice president shall chair the interministerial, that is a provision, that is a provision in the, in, the, in the document. The vice president shall chair the interministerial steering committee to ensure sector coherence in implementation. Now we have the high level national committee, which I mentioned, to bring together government ministers, high level representatives from the donor community, private sector, civil society, professional associations, and others designated by the office of the president they to bring them together. And this committee shall be chaired by the vice president. It's a high level committee. Now we have the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs that shall chair the government donor consultative forum. This is the responsibility assigned to, 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 to the ministry. Then the Minister of Lands and Regional Administration shall chair the regional and municipal forum, which is tasked with the responsibility to ensure proper alignment of the national development plan and regional, municipal, and local development plans. You know, earlier, if we relate this, this arrangement to what we started with in module uh, one, in terms of the uh, uh, dimensions, dimensions of, uh, of planning, and we're talking there about regional, about national, and then we look at devolution in terms of the enabling environment. So you have even at regional, municipal, and local le le level having their own plans, you know, which will be harmonized if the national development plan is to, is to be prepared. Now, at the technical implementation level, which is the second uh, component of the uh, institutional arrangement? The plan stipulated the following arrangements. There'll be a national technical standing committee comprised, comprising uh, all permanent secretaries chaired by the Secretary General of the Civil Service, uh, which should review and approve work plans, progress and monitoring reports for onward submission to the uh, MNSC. Directors of development planning within the Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs shall act as secretary. Now, the, there should be a technical cluster that shall draw together all the MDAs delivering on the respective priorities of the plan. And their functions will be to develop the annual work plans, undertake joint monitoring and prepare progress reports. They shall ensure cooperation and alignment of individual MDA work plans related to that strategic priority. Consequently, there shall be 15 technical clusters, private sector, civil society organizations, United Nations agencies, and other development partners shall be members of the clusters based on the areas of expertise. Now, the 
another line of responsibility is assigned to a national MIA platform, which shall be established to ensure adequate monitoring and evaluation of the plan uh, uh, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and all the uh, 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 directors of uh, development planning will coordinate the work of the technical clusters and the m and &E platform. And it shall also bring together state and non-state actors. At the regional level, the uh, MDT shall ensure that world and local development programs and projects are aligned with the National Development Plan and shall undertake m and &E and other related uh, uh, activities. Now, um, we should, apart from identifying these institutions, the question we need to ask, how effective are these institutional arrangements? And one major lesson learned from the planning experience in Gambia was the need to maintain a viable institutional framework to ensure effective and efficient management of plan administration. A major reason for the poor coordination uh, of policies, lack of sufficient linkages between sector priorities and plan and program priorities was the absence of appropriate and active institutional machinery. And so this, this has been the experience. These institutions were put in place and it is, it is, it is over, over the years and even in many places we have, we have this kind of arrangement. It is easy to understand the need for this structure and even to put the structure in place. But the problem is how to make them effective, how to provide adequate resources to let them discharge the roles and responsibilities assigned to them. And so what we find is that some of these institutional arrangements tend to be dysfunctional along, along, the, along the line. You know, and, and part of the thing we'll do here is to um, look at ways in which the situation can be remedied uh, in future. And so as you are also gearing up to, to prepare another plan, because we we'll soon come to the end of this 2018 to 2021 plan, you, 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 we, need, we need to look at some ways of avoiding past mistakes based on the lesson we have learned, and this kind of poor coordination and so on. So, and there are four areas that are uh, suggested here we need to look into. That is first is creation of synergy among sectoral policies to avoid the risk of such policies contradicting each other and making overall development targets unattainable. Another way is identify mechanism for integration of sectoral and macroeconomic priorities. It is very important. Third is the coordination of activities of development partners. The various development partners assisting in various sectors, working with various MDAs, but sometimes at cross purposes, sometimes with great overlaps, in which resources are thinly spread and the output and outcomes are substandard, are suboptimal. So we need we need proper coordination of activities of development partners. And lastly, the creation of a proper linkage between development planning and the annual budgets. This, this, this will be very, very, very useful uh, to make these institutional arrangements work better for planning. Now, another area of concern in this module that we need to focus on is the financing mechanisms. There's no doubt that resource mobilization has been a major challenge has consistently restricted achievement of plan and program objectives over the years. In fact, the first three development programs were predominantly funded by British grants and loans in the Gambia. And for the first and second development plans, the government succeeded in diversifying its resources of development assistance and obtained concessionary loans from different bilateral and multilateral agencies, particularly the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the African Development Bank, the British government, and China. The implementation of the Poverty Reduction Strategy Paper One, for example, PRSP One and PRSP Two, were preceded by organization of donor conferences, during which substantial pledges were made 
by the, the development partners. So, but sometimes you can also make these promises and pledges, but because of uh, several other reasons, you know, uh, these pledges uh, might not be fully met. So the plan and cost funding experience has not been too palatable. For example, projects under the PRSP2 were estimated to cost several $52 million, of which government was supposed to contribute about $100 million, and development partners about $174 million, leaving a funding gap of $479 million uh, uh, to, 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 to be, to be, to be uh, to, to be bridged. The resources from HIPIC were supposed to reduce gap of 20 million. Fortunately, resources from HIPIC itself fell short of their anticipated amounts, you know? So we, 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 we therefore need uh, to properly articulate strategies to mobilize resources because, because of what is even happening internationally, the uh, resource is dwindling uh, all over all over the world in terms of uh, even budgets that uh, many countries are facing, uh, complicated by the uh, by COVID-19 and all the restrictions, and then the declines in growth in many economies of the world will not make external funding to be a reliable source of, of planned financing uh, going forward. So it hopes it, 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 it on on, on every nation to, to uh, think about innovative mechanisms uh, to, to, to really finance the, the, uh, the plan. And also to cut uh, this cloth according uh, uh, to, 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 the, to the coat, according to the cloth, not according to, to the size. So this, this principle will need to really uh, bring it into, into four. Cut your coat according to your cloth and not according to your size. So you see, because sometimes you have a lot to do, you identify so many areas of priorities and then um, um, when resources become limited, non-available, then there are various gaps, budgets are abandoned, uh, expectations are dashed, hopes are dashed, and then when you look at the performance, uh, my review of this of these plans, you find out that you you, you are far away uh, from your uh, from your targets. Now, but if you look at the strategies in the case of the Cambia, there is a multi-pronged strategy for financing the plan, included among other uh, actions, domestic resource mobilization innovative financing instruments, concessionary financing. And then, and then during the period, there is a particular strategy which details key flagship programs to drive plan, uh, plan implementation. And let's look at the domestic resource mobilization as a major instrument of uh, financing the plan. Now, the Gambia relies heavily on taxation to finance government expenditure, but because of the debt service obligations we mentioned the other time, government has been unable to allocate significant resources to finance development. And in the context of the NDP 2021 contribution to implement development agenda. First is the need is the um, idea to continue the path of prudent fiscal management, sound monetary policy and structural reforms expected to rationalize the budget. The second approach is prudent debt management, especially domestic borrowing, which will lead to increased fiscal space. And the third strategy is the more efficient revenue collections mechanisms and simplifying and expanding the, 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 the tax base. So we, we this, this, that is the strategy and approach in terms of domestic resource mobilization. But in terms of innovative financing that were introduced during that plan period, we have um, professional frameworks for innovative financing in the Gambia, which reflect the highest level of social responsibility and ethical business standards. They were made to be consistent with the sustainability goals of the Addis Ababa Agenda of Financing for Development, which itself is an integral part of the United Nations Agenda 2030. 
Now, to ensure a successful implementation of the NDP, attention was focused in the Gambia on alternative and more innovative ways of development financing, such as PPP, that is public-private partnerships, capital markets, and blended finance, especially in view of the contractual global finance agenda we talked about earlier, and the need to move away from aid. Now, look, let us look at uh, some of the features of these innovations. First, let's take public-private partnerships and other financing mechanisms. You know, PPP is a model that has proven successful in upgrading existing and financing new infrastructure projects in the Gambia. And in order to facilitate and promote this approach, government created an explicit and comprehensive PPP policy framework aimed at developing new infrastructure assets and managing and upgrading existing ones. The comprehensive PPP policies has established a broad framework for implementation in financing infrastructure and services while being sensitive to public needs and national uh, priorities. Now, th there are specific priorities areas identified for PPPs because PPP may not be applicable to, 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 to a number of things, but, but good, good procedure that uh, from the review of the various possibilities, the key priority infrastructure services needs have been identified. And, and they include electricity sector, focus on power generation, transmission, and distribution, ferry services, focus on acquisition, maintenance, and operation, water supply, solid waste ma management, sewage, and sanitation. The, in the road sector, PPP will focus on construction and maintenance of expressways, miscellaneous bypasses, ring roads, bridges. Sector, developing networks, exchanges, backbones, and so on. Then in the health sector, PPP will focus on building projects such as teaching hospital, headquarter offices, staff living quarters, as well as technical support functions, laboratory services, radiology services, blood bank, etc. Then agriculture related projects such as irrigation projects, training, quality testing of inputs and outputs. Then urban services such as street lighting and urban roads, and also sports, stadia facilities and so on were prioritized on the uh, PPP arrangement. Now, another area of financing is, is the concessionary finance. And in view of the limited fiscal space due to how this servicing, uh, debt servicing, which we, we talked about later, the government uh, also has been relying on grants and loans of a highly concessionary nature for development financing. And this to avoid further exposure, uh, you know, increasing the fiscal risk and vulnerability to, of, of the economy. So government has been working with the both traditional and non-traditional partner, partners to secure the uh, concessionary uh, fin financing. Now, the, the role of Gambian diaspora in national development received a very uh, uh, high priority uh, during the NDP 2018-21. The goal for the diaspora that is to expand, enhance, and optimize the role of, 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 of this uh, the sector in, in national development as value partners. And the, the number of res, uh, results expected from that, for example, the diaspora strategy validated by 50 ministry departments and agencies were, were, was put in place. So say a Gambia diaspora directorate with focal points in 50 MDS, embassies and missions. Then there's also capacity de developed for 2,500 government and non-state actors personnel on diaspora development. Also transaction cost of remittances sent to the Gambia was reduced to uh, an average of 3%. Then 20 diaspora direct investments and issuance of two diaspora bonds facilitated as, uh, this um, during this period. Then the co-financing of 100 civil society and social impact projects from, from the, from the uh, diaspora. So that is, that is uh, what the field will come from the uh, kind of a diaspora financing. And the, the diaspora strategy 
was also uh, uh, put in place to create a structured, effective, and efficient framework to optimize their contributions to Gambian development. You know, so it is 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 the strategy was formulated with an implementation plan. And some of the key commitments outlined in the president's diaspora policy statement and set out in the NDP were incorporated into the uh, in the diaspora strategy. And the Gambian diaspora strategy is for a 10 year period from 2018 to 2027, supplemented by a three year practical implementation plan that focuses on priority themes and action. This is an important step towards the mainstreaming of diaspora development in, 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 the, in, the, in the Gambia. And then the, 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 the Gambia Diaspora Directorate was created. And, the, and this uh, directorate in the NDP, there, so do, so is, the, the provision is made for it to be created within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Gambians abroad, you know. It was designed to be a service delivery unit to facilitate structured and optimal interface between government and the diaspora, while at the same time coordinating diaspora related issues with the different uh, MDAs. Now, uh, this directorate, the Cambia diaspora, diaspora Directorate was to take the lead in implementing many aspects of the diaspora strategy uh, mentioned above through direct service delivery, as well as liaison and coordination of actions and activities with different governmental, non-governmental and international bodies. There's an additional function of working closely with the Minister of Interior to facilitate effective intergovernmental and interagency collaboration regarding the Gambian migration policy. Then the, 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 the diaspora development fund was part of this uh, effort and this provided uh, uh, was provided for in the NDP that the fund was to be uh, uh, to be created to grant project co-financing for Gambian diaspora organizations involved in community civil service, social enterprise, and cooperative activities in different parts uh, of the country. And it was stipulated in that document that the Diaspora Development Fund shall provide loans, equity investment, and other forms of co-investment for diaspora entrepreneurs and investors to stimulate and expand job creation and social impact investments in the Gambia. Hometown district alumni and sectoral nonprofit diaspora groups were expected also to apply to the fund to leverage and supplement the resources they raise by themselves. Targets were set for the Diaspora Development Fund in terms of one, irregular backway migrants to be reduced by 60%, negotiation and signing of four migration and development bilateral agreements, associate target to facilitate circular migration contracts for 350 skilled migrant workers, complete full registration of diaspora voters and vice diaspora voting presidential elections, facilitate 14 representatives of the diaspora to have observer status in the seven local government areas, to create platform for 50 diaspora development organizations covering 10 sectors in three continents, to assess and utilize the services of 100 highly skilled diaspora professionals to promote campaign development. So that is the, the target set for the, uh, uh, that, that uh, directorate as part of the innovative approaches for funding plans. Now, one other important strategy is reduction in the transaction cost of remittances. You know, remittances create is a, another source of uh, 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 really uh, funds, you know, to uh, finance investment in, 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 the, in the country. And the result of transaction costs is to leverage diaspora remittances and investment. And according to the World Bank, in 2016, diaspora remittances to the Gambia was $200 million, being 21.5% of a, of, a, of a GDP. This figure does not even include remittances sent through informal channels. In 2014, as a percentage of 
uh, of GDP, the Gambia was the 10th remittance receiving country in the world and the third in Africa. The Central Bank of the Gambia, working together with the Minister of Finance, the MSDG Technical Cooperation Project and other partners were to develop and implement a scheme to reduce the transaction costs of remittances sent to the Gambia to the lowest level possible. And the scheme is in line with the uh, uh, targets of SDGs that by 2030, they should reduce uh, the transaction cost to less than 3% of migrant remittances and eliminate remittance corridors with costs higher than 5%. It will also be implemented in the line with the Joint Bilateral Action Plan adopted in November 2015. That in addition to the 3% SDG target, identify corridors for remittance transfers where the partners commit to substantially reduce the cost by 2020 from Europe to Africa and within Africa. For some remittance corridors, the cost of sending money to the Gambia is over 20%. Mark you. So even for a well-developed market such as the UK Gambia Remittance Corridor, the World Bank reported that in July 2017, the total cost was 9.7%, being over three times the SDG target of 3%, which means there's still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go in terms of reducing uh, transaction costs of remittance. But it is a good idea that it, it, is, it is already prioritized and the Gambia government will work on ways of getting this target met, having a reduction in transaction costs to promote a higher inflow of remittance to the country. Another financing innovation is the diaspora direct investment and diaspora bonds. The highest ever inflow of foreign direct investment in the Gambia was 2006 at $82 million. In that year, diaspora remittances received was $64 million. In the intervening 10 years, the trends have reversed. In 2016, FDI figures were in the negative, with 1.5 million being withdrawn from the Gambian economy, whilst the diaspora remittance stood at an all time high of $200 million. So the private remittances sent to family and friends are mostly used for social investment and consumption, paying recurrent costs of feeding, health, education, and social amenities of families. The diaspora through their remittances played a fundamental role in reducing hunger and poverty, improving health, and attaining other key SDG goals and targets. Beyond current consumption expenditure, there's untapped opportunity to attract remittances towards durable investments and economically productive activities in the Gambia economy. In this regard, emphasis was placed on a wide range of schemes, including consolidating and updating existing FDI related tax breaks and, and incentives and structuring them to meet the specific and specialized needs of the direct diaspora investment uh, initiative. Laws, regulation and practices uh, were to be revised where appropriate to facilitate new and innovative forms of the, the uh, diaspora financing uh, uh, initiatives. So, these are the various initiatives that have been embarked upon uh, uh, to uh, uh, harness resources to fund the, 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 the plan. I, there is a review process, annual review process of, um, of the plan so that progress reports are issued annually and then it, it will be uh, easy to track whether these uh, ideas that have been laid out in the NDP in terms of the target sets and so on, it, it will be good if the annual progress reports keep track of this so that we can see what the achievements have been over these last four years. So this is uh, 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 where we're going to stop as far as uh, this module five is concerned. There are exercises that you will take that to, to track to track uh, the understanding in addition to the uh, to the uh, quiz questions. Quiz questions are also available, which you will go through, and then which will uh, 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 show the extent of uh, understanding 
that we have got from this presentation. And you have the practical sessions where the there will be exercises where we're going to share ideas, where we can discuss, uh, particularly the likely effect of COVID-19 on domestic resource financing. We need to think about this, you know, most of the, even the diaspora expectations. This is what we're talking about when we're looking at a scenario. If we project the scenario that inflow from diaspora will be so time, uh, so, so amount, now you have a fortuitous situation. Uh, uh, even 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 the uh, COVID nineteen now will have effect not only on domestic resource mobilization but also on uh, inflow of uh, uh, the diaspora funds because even where they were anywhere in the world even the developed world where where uh, the Gambian citizens are the the the, the, the disruption of uh, economic activities and so. We will see, be able to see and discuss in the various areas where this uh, uh, COVID 19 pandemic uh, will affect uh, uh, the finance of budgets uh, in, the, in the Gambia. So, th thank you very much for your attention.